So well, let's be mindful of everyone's time and um, we'll get started. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, uh, good evening uh, to those of you who are joining from uh, around the country and around the world. Uh, welcome to this uh, Rutgers Institute for Quantitative Biomedicine crash course. Uh, my name is Stephen Burley. I'm the uh, founding director and I'm a university professor and Henry Rutgers chair here at, uh, at the university. Uh, I will be, be introducing the IQB very briefly and uh, then uh, turning uh, the floor over to uh, my colleague, uh, Bar Van Osen, who is the head of the Office of, uh, for Advanced Research Computing. Uh, our vision at the Institute is uh, to uh, support a center of excellence for interdisciplinary quantitative biomedical research. We have a bipartite mission uh, that includes fostering a uh, community of scholars uh, committed to collaborative quantitative biomedical research and training the next generation of quantitative researchers at the interface with biology and medicine. Uh, the Institute building, uh, the proteomics building here at Rutgers on the Bush campus houses a number of core facilities and resources. And I want to draw your particular attention to the RCSB Protein Data Bank. This is the US data center for the global uh, worldwide protein data bank uh, open access resource about which you'll hear a great deal uh, during the course of this uh, crash course. We have an interdisciplinary graduate program, and I urge any of you who are interested in uh, pursuing PhD studies in quantitative biomedicine to uh, uh, look up our website, iqb.rutgers.edu, and if necessary, contact our graduate director, Professor Sagair Kare, who will be speaking a little bit later the, uh, in the session. We uh, are um, hosting a variety of uh, interdisciplinary research working groups on important topics in biomedicine. Uh, we um, uh, have both winter and summer boot camps. Uh, the uh, January 22 boot camp is now fully enrolled for uh, training in science communication. And we have these um, uh, crash courses, typically one or two times every semester. And this is the, uh, the second crash course of the, uh, the fall semester. So with, uh, with that, I will stop sharing and uh, turn the floor over to my friend and colleague, uh, Barb Van Osen, who's the head of the Office for Advanced Research Computing. Thank you, Stephen. So uh, duty is to introduce the next uh, guest, uh, who is uh, Dr. Michael Zwick. He is the new senior vice president for the um, Office for Research at uh, uh, Rutgers University. He's only been here for, I think, just a couple of months. So, uh, so very new. And uh, so he's going to have a, a, a few uh, uh, welcoming words uh, to this to this group. Um, but before coming to Rutgers, he was an associate vice president for uh, research of the Robert Woodruff Health Sciences Center at Emory University. He's also associate dean of the research uh, and Associate Dean of Research and Professor of Human Genetics and Pediatrics at Emory University School of Medicine. So we're very fortunate to have him uh, join Rutgers uh, recently as the Senior Vice President for Research. So uh, thank you, uh, Michael. Well, thank you, Barr. Thank you, uh, thank you, Stephen. Uh, thank you, Barr, for that kind introduction. Thank you for inviting me to, to speak today. Uh, I'm really pleased to welcome you virtually to Rutgers University and to attend this really exciting and I think cutting edge course. Um, you know, I looked at the agenda and, and apparently my role is to welcome and provide you the crash course learning objectives, <laughs> which seems like quite a, quite, a, quite, a, uh, quite a bit to ask for someone who's the new senior vice president for research. So, um, so I thought, you know, I can certainly of course welcome you uh, the learning objectives are a bit more of a challenge. Uh, and so I will, I will offer a bit of advice and a perspective from, from my perspective. So, so the advice I'll offer you is uh, turn off your email, <laughs> pay attention, uh, use the chat and ask questions and engage uh, with the speakers at the appropriate time. Because I think the back and forth uh, in the virtual world, I mean, this is, you know, we've been living in a pandemic, but we've all gotten very good at using Zoom. Uh, Zoom has made the world a little bit smaller, and it's it's amazing the number of people who've signed up for this and and where you are throughout the world. So so take advantage of that opportunity to really interact and meet colleagues and, and exchange ideas and information. 
And then as a perspective, a, a scientific perspective, I, I want to make a comment as a, as a human geneticist in my career, the discovery of human genetic variation has really been the key barrier limiting progress in my field. Uh, and as you're aware, as I'm sure all of you are aware, that barrier is receding very rapidly. Uh, even though I'll point out that uh, there's been only a recent publication sequencing the centromere of, of the X chromosome uh, published nearly 20 years after the initial draft of the human genome was completed. So uh, while there's been remarkable progress, there still remains a lot to do. But if finding variation is becoming so much easier, figuring out what it does is the new key barrier limiting discovery. Uh, and my science has, you know, has, has included this interplay between experimentation and computing. And I think Dr. Burley's recent perspective in the New England Journal of Medicine, which I encourage you to read if you've not, not seen it, really elegantly describes in, in the area of protein structure, this interplay between computing and wet lab experimentation. Now today you're gonna to focus on computing and AI, which I think is really revolutionary and offers incredible potential. Uh, but I think I encourage you to keep an open mind and recognize that the interplay between experimentation and straightforward high performance computing and structure are really a, a critical access for discovery. Um, and so I encourage you to embrace both those perspectives and, and think a little bit about not only the exciting computing that you're gonna talk about today, but what experiments might you pursue? Uh, and, and bringing those two ideas together, those two modalities together, I think will really help you achieve the maximum impact in your research. So thank you and, uh, and I hope you enjoy the crash course today. Thank you very much, Michael. I, um, those are definitely words to live by. Uh, so let me, before introducing the first speaker, just say a few words about, uh, about the structure of the, this afternoon. Uh, our goal is to present you with a broad overview of how artificial intelligence and machine learning methods are being used in de novo protein structure prediction. And then uh, after the break to provide you with a ha some hands-on experience with both AlphaFold2 uh, and RosettaFold. So let's begin with the, um, uh, the first author of the um, Rosetta Fold paper, uh, Dr. Ming-Kyung Ming Baek from the University of Washington, where she's a postdoctoral fellow with uh, David Baker, who was the originator of, uh, of Rosetta many, many uh, years ago. Uh, I um, co-founded a company with, uh, with uh, David uh, back in the um, in about the year uh, year two thousand, and um, have fond memories of uh, David's uh, initial early attempts uh, with Rosetta, which have yielded benefits that none of us could uh, have anticipated uh, in no in no small part uh, because of the um, the efforts of of Dr. Baek. So, Ming Kyung. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for agreeing to give this talk. And um, even more important, thank you for bringing Rosetta Fold to life. Thanks for the kind introduction. So let me share my screen first. Hope all of you can see my slide. Okay, thanks for inviting me here and giving me a chance to present my research study for all of you. And I'm Min Kyung, a postdoc in David Baker's group at University of Washington. Today, I will present a create protein structure prediction using artificial intelligence, which would bring disruptive transformation in many structural biology studies. Recently, there was a breakthrough in structural biology based on bio big data and artificial intelligence. The AI-based computational method can predict protein structures with experimental quality in just a few minutes or hours and it can significantly reduce the time and labor cost in experimental protein structure determination. And it will change the frameworks of protein structure research from experiment to AI-based computational modeling or interplay, interplay between them. Today, I will present how AI could become a breakthrough in this field and what would the impact in overall biological research is. So I organize today's talk in three parts. I will first introduce how protein structure prediction method has been developed so far and why AI could become a breakthrough in this field. Then I will move on to the underlying concept of AlphaFold and Rosetta Fold method. And I will briefly talk about the impact of this method on some biological sciences and its application to the large scale in in silico PPI screening. 
To make sure that everyone is on the same page, I'd like to briefly introduce how protein structure prediction method has been developed. The basic assumption of protein structure prediction is if the two protein or segments have similar sequences, they will probably have similar structures. So if there is non-protein structure having similar sequence to the target, you can build a target protein structure by aligning or threading the target sequence into the template structure. If there's no template, one can try free modeling or the novel modeling to predict protein structure. Instead of using global template, it enumerates many possible structures by assembling short fragments having similar local sequences to the target. Because the confirmation space is too large to search or possible confirmations, it requires a lot of computations and success rates are usually very low. So in this case, it's really essential to get a kind of additional information, which can reduce search space to predict more reliable structure. A kind of search information is the predicted contact based on co-evolution analysis. To maintain protein function during the evolution process, protein should maintain its structure. So if a mutation causes severe changes in structures, protein will lose its own function and that organism cannot survive. As a result, if two residues are closed in 3D space, these interacting residues should be commutated to maintain each interaction. So by analyzing the multiple sequence alignment of homologs, that is basically a set of evolutionary related sequences, we can find these co correlated mutation patterns and from there, we can predict contact between residues that is very valuable to generate reliable structures. And many programs, including Gremlin, have been developed to predict contact from the MSA using some traditional statistical method. However, a traditional approach requires a lot of sequences to get a statistically meaningful predictions from the MSA. If you have very shallow MSA, like this case, only 36 sequences in the MSA, it cannot predict meaningful contact like this, and it gives just noises. Then how to overcome this limitation? How can you make more powerful contact prediction method working even for shallow MSA? At this point, people have tried to apply artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is basically trying to learn some representations from given data by using multiple layers of neural networks. It's exceptionally effective at learning hidden patterns in the given data. So if you provide the system tons of training examples, it somehow begins to understand hidden patterns and respond in useful ways to predict or generate something. The key point here is that deep learning is very good at recognizing hidden patterns. That's why people thought if the if we provide plenty amount of training protein examples to deep neural networks, it will learn how to predict contact even if just few homolog sequences exist in the MSA. Then which kind of AI method would work best for contact prediction that can help generate the better protein structure? What people first focus was the AI techniques for image processing. Let's think about contact prediction procedure again. In contact prediction, you first extract some covariance information from the given MSA, then try to predict the contact based on this covariance data. You might notice it, the input for contact prediction are 2D images having multiple channels, and the output is also the 2D images. Many people thought this is the analog of image processing in AI field and started to apply AI technique like convolutional neural network to predict contact or even distances between two residues. Tia Lozada developed like two years ago is the one of the representative method for predicting protein structures by applying an artificial intelligence method for image processing. Tia Lozada extracts the input features such as target protein sequence information, amino acid frequency at each residue position, and some covariance metrics from the MSA to create a 2D image input with multiple channels. Then the AI 
technique called the convolutional neural network is applied to predict the distance between C beta atoms of two residues or the, those additional angles, which can represent orientation between two residues. And those predicted distance and orientation information are converted into an energy function and used to create the protein structure through the additional energy optimization step. By applying the AI method used in image processing, it, become, it became possible to predict contact or distances, even for the cases where it was impossible with conventional statistical methods like Gremlin. I brought the protein example I showed you earlier. And since there are only 36 sequences in the MSA, it cannot be predicted with the previous statistical method. But by applying AI, TL Rojara can predict much better protein contact close to the ground truth. There is a community-wide experiment called CASP, which is considered as a kind of world championship in protein structure prediction. AI for image processing achieved a similar amount of the improvement in only four years, which actually took more than 20 years with traditional method development as shown in this figure. But to say, we really solved this, pro this protein structure prediction problem and make predicted structures really useful, we should achieve this line corresponding to the experimental structure quality. Then how can we improve the method? How can we achieve this goal with AI? To answer this question, let's revisit the previous method with AI for image processing. There are many methods which utilize AI technique for image processing to protein structure prediction, but all of them had somewhat similar flaws. In all the methods developed previously, including the TR Rojara, structural information is extracted from the MSA only once using some traditional co-evolution analysis method or some simple neural network. Once it got the processed pairwise features from the MSA, the initial residual pairwise interaction information, it never goes back to the MSA and just keep trying to refine that pairwise feature through the convolutional neural network to get a better distance prediction. And the predicted distances are converted as restraint energies and by doing energy minimization against the converted least change, it generates the model structure. Let's first think about this first step, extracting residual pairwise interaction information from the MSA. I just redraw the problem to make it easier to find something similar to this in the AI field. So the target problem here is drawing a kind of 2D image from some kind of 1D given, given 1D input. You can imagine this is somehow similar to draw a picture based on the sentences describing how that picture looks like. For example, let's say someone asks you drawing some picture corresponds to this description. Then what would you do, to, what would you do first to draw this picture? I would first figure out which object should be in the painting. So there should be Mike, dog, grill, Jenny, and table. And based on this information, I would do a very brief sketch. Then by comparing my painting to description, I, I would find more details and keep filling the details and keep modifying my uh, paintings to complete my picture. Let's go back to our original problem. What we want to do here is basically very similar to draw the paintings based on description in the MSA. So it might be better to take this kind of iterative approach to complete a such kind of paintings as what we did for this the text to image generation case. Now we can design some AI architecture with iterative approach with some neural networks to encode the MSAs and pairwise interaction features with frequent communications between them. And what kind of neural network we should use to encode the MSA and pair features? would be the convolutional neural network still the best choice. In case of convolutional neural network, information flows through the local neighborhood. This is because this method itself was developed for images. For example, here's an image with a human face and which pixel have the most important information to learn this pixel actually presents the eye. 
it will be the pixels right next to it. Since the pixels right next to the target pixel contains the most important information in the image, you can think that it would be more efficient to conduct learning based on the information around the local neighborhood rather than looking at the whole image all together. Sorry. Yeah. Um, then let's think about the protein. With convolutional network, only residues that are close in sequence are considered. However, in predicting protein structures, residues that are close in 3D space, but distant in sequence space are also very important. So the network itself should have some ability to figure out or learn which residue pairs are important and that information flows to them. The attention mechanism is suitable for this kind of problem because it learns the relationship between the point or residues by generating the additional attention layer and can control the information flow dynamically through these learned attentions. That's why attention network has better inductive bias than the conversion network for protein structure prediction problem. Okay, so now we replace the conversion network with attention-based ones. So through the attention network, it keeps trying to find information in the MSA to draw the picture of the 2D interactions and those processes communicate to each other very frequently so that it can draw a picture that really matches where to give an MSA. Then final thing we should think about, can you replace this additional folding step with AI method? In other words, what would be the best representation for protein structure? In the previous AI-based protein modeling method, they predicted 2D projected protein structures such as contact, distance, and orientation maps, and combined those 2D predictions with external energy minimization methods like Rosetta, like Rosetta to generate the 3D atomic coordinate of proteins. But as you can think easily, the best way to represent protein structures is actually presenting it with its atomic XYZ coordinate rather than this kind of 2D transformed images. And thanks to the recent advances in AI, especially dealing with the 3D equivariants, it became possible to, to handle with the Cartesian coordinate directly using the AI method. So combine all ideas together, we can make some updated diagrams for AI-based protein modeling like this. It first extracts the residue pairwise interactions from the MSA through these iterative approaches based on the attention networks, then generate the atomic coordinate directly using some AI-based structure generator. Based on those ideas, AI-based high accuracy protein structure prediction method named AlphaFold and RoseraFold were developed and published recently. In the AlphaFold method, they have two different tracks to process sequence features and residue pairwise features, and those two communi communicate to each other or give some signal and feedback to update them so that it can extract the better structure information next time, as I explained earlier. And unlike the previous approaches like TR Rosetta, the structure feature extraction so is no longer one shot prediction, it's done in, in iterative fashion. Also, they use the attention algorithm because it has a better inductive bias. And they also introduced the structure module that generates and defines the 3D coordinate on the fly in fully differentiable manner. And by introducing this structure module, they, train, they can train this upward model end-to-end -end from sequence to exact 3D atomic coordinate. And this end-to-end -end training allows the direct structure information flow through the network by helping them learn better pictures to predict 3D structures. Rosetta Ford also has very similar architecture. It first processes sequence and pairwise features in parallel with frequent communication between them. But unlike Alpha Ford, Rosetta Ford introduced the third track that operates in 3D coordinate space and built a tighter connection between sequence 2D rigid pairwise interactions and 3D coordinate. By introducing this third track, we can further enforce these pairwise features, actually encode the 3D realizable information and more consistent to its corresponding structure. 
in addition to this, by updating sequence and pairwise features based on these the feedbacks from the intermediate structures, we can more efficiently model sequence to structure relation with the smaller number of iterations compared to the alpha fold. With those advanced AI methods, we could achieve our goal for protein structure prediction. Now, performance of the both alpha fold and rosetta fold are getting much close to the point that we can say protein structure prediction problem is solved. With the rosetta fold and alpha fold method, it became able to solve various structure determination problems. Both the rosetta fold and alpha fold method were able to solve hard molecular replacement problem. So in the left figure, I brought some MR examples with rosetta fold models. The experimentally determined structures are colored in gray, while the rosetta fold models colored in blue thread based on the predictive model confidence. And you can see the regions that rosetta fold were confident about, which colored in blue, are almost exactly matched to the experimental structures. Also, the predicted models can be used to solve low resolution cryo-EM structures. Here, I brought alpha fold examples. The alpha fold models fitted well into the density map, and it would be easy enough to get the final model after some simple refinement with density map data, starting from this model. And this model also can actually fill the, the low resolution, the density, the area. I explained that coevolution is the key concept for the AI-based protein structure prediction method. As I explained earlier, coevolution is a product of a kind of selection pressure to maintain protein's function by maintaining its structure. You can think this coevolution also may happen between two different proteins in the same organism, where their interactions are very important to do their role in biological processes. We reason that because the network learned how to extract coevolution patterns from the given MSA, it might be able to predict the structure of the protein-protein complexes directly from the sequence information if we can provide rare paired MSAs. So it could reduce the computational cost of the standard procedure of building models for individual subunits, carrying out the rigid bar docking and further offering some kind of refinement. So I think the using the Rosetta Ford or Alpha Ford to predict the complex structure prediction would be the, the, the good way to generate the complex structures in uh, with a very small computational cost. And so we benchmark the performance, and these four cases are the successful examples that showing the Rosetta Ford the complex modeling ability. In this figure, the left ones are the native structure, and the right ones are the models of the Rosetta Ford. So as you can see, it could generate the very accurate protein complex models if we can get a good pair sequence alignment. The same story is also true for the Rosetta, uh, also true for the alpha fold, and alpha fold also can predict the protein complex structures really well if you provide the paired sequence alignment. Based on this observation, we are seeking to a way for in silico PPI screening with Rosetta Ford and Alpha Ford method. As both Rosetta Ford and Alpha Ford learns how to extract the coevolution patterns from given data, we thought it would be we thought it would be it would give some signals for whether two proteins interact with each other or not. So we tried to further extend this approach to screen entire interactome of yeast proteins. From all possible pairs of yeast proteins, we selected like four, about 4.3 million pairs to screen based on the depth of the pair MSA and number of total reduce. As we need to screen more than millions of pairs, we need some efficient enough initial screening method before trying to build, in, trying to build their exact 3D coordinate. For this purpose, we use the one of the initial version of the Rosetta Ford which only has two track architecture having less number of parameters. And this model takes about 10 seconds for complex structure prediction having, having a thousand amino acid. And, among, and using this Rosetta Ford method, among 4.3 million pairs, we can choose about 5,000 pairs 
having maximum interchange contact probability over 0.9. And for those pairs past this criteria, we also run the alpha four to filter the, I mean, to select the really confident one, really confident one, and the model their structures using alpha fold. This shows how to track Rosetta fold and alpha fold with Rosetta fold filter works on selecting interaction pairs. There are 768 pairs having strong experimental evidence of their interactions. And we compare the previous traditional coevolution analysis method and Rosetta Ford on how well they distinguish the interacting pairs, pairs from randomly generated non-interacting pairs. In this figure, the larger area under the curve means the better performance. With the previous simple direct coupling analysis method, which is basically the state-of-the-art method, it was unable to score those strong interaction pairs from the others. But two track Rosetta Ford shows much better performance than this DCA method. And after initial filtering of Rosetta Ford, Alpha Ford shows much better performance on distinguished to strong interaction pairs from the others. So based on this result, we conclude that the combination of Rosetta Ford and Alpha Ford is one of a good way to screen entire interactome that having high enough accuracy. Those models are showing some predicted model structures. The protein complexes colored in brown and blue are the newly, newly predicted interaction, not having any published experimental, I mean, high throughput experimental evidence yet. The other colors are the protein pairs having a kind of experimental evidence. We try to verify one of the newly found interactions by observing whether two proteins interact when you mutate the predicted interface residues to prevent binding. As you can see here, the mutation we introduced significantly drops the interaction between those two proteins. And we concluded that these two proteins are interacting with each other by forming the predicted complex structures. And based on the pairwise interaction prediction, we are able to predict higher order assemblies from trimer to heteropentamer. And I brought some example of tribal prediction, the rod 51, 55, 57 complex. And the rod 51 is actually known to assist in repair of DNA double strand breaks and considered to have two or more states, the resting closed link state and the functional filament state. When we overlaid our trimer prediction model to rod 51 filament structure, we found that interaction with the interaction with last 55 and 57 can disrupt the ring conformation and serve as an initial initiation point for the last 51 filament to grow upon. And actually there's a study based on single molecule imaging, which found that this last 55 and 57 accelerate assembly of this last 50, 51 filament during the double strand break repair through some transient interaction with the last 51. And this model, can explain the experimental observation pretty well. As I shown, by performing large-scale in silico PPI screening, we can get better understanding of protein's function and their mechanism. Moreover, through the PPI modeling, especially for proteins involved in the disease, we can find a new drug target to treat human disease and develop therapeutics targeting specific protein-protein interactions. I'd like to summarize my talk like this. So with the artificial intelligence, it becomes able to predict the high enough accuracy protein models. And those predictions are mainly made based on the co-evolution patterns in multiple sequence alignment. So it actually uses the evolution history. And when we make this advances with the AI, it was really important to design AI architecture specifically for the protein structure prediction problem. So it, it's not like AI somehow solved the problem by itself. It's more like we actually put a lot of human effort to design the AI architecture and, and make AI works in this kind of problem. And also we performed the large scale PPI screening and protein-protein complex structure prediction. And, if, and those are possible if we can pre provide the paired MSA and and yeah, it can replace the traditional protein-protein, the docking method or other commutation method and, 
and with a more, with less computational cost. I'd like to thank all the people involved in this project and happy to take any question. Thank you very much, uh, Ming Kyung. Great talk. Uh, we have more questions than there is time for, but there's one uh, that I find um, particularly interesting. So I'll, I will ask that from the chat. The other questions we'll give you, um, give you access to so that you can, uh, you can type answers if you would like. Um, the, the question that I think would be interesting to, um, uh, paraphrasing would be interesting for the audience to hear about, how do AI methods work on transmembrane proteins, membrane associated proteins, um, and partially unstructured proteins. Yeah. So, so uh, alpha fold and rosetta fold actually both are actually works pretty well on the membrane transmembrane proteins because actually they are mainly rely on the evolution history rather than rather than their explicit I mean physical principles of the interaction with the membranes. So the those interaction the physical principles in encoded in the evolution history. And by just mining that evolution history, alpha fold and rosetta fold both work well for both, I mean, either soluble protein and transmembrane proteins. For the partially unstructured proteins, I mean, uh, both methods are actually good at predicting the disordered region, but it, it might be a little bit hard to how that protein works with the, the, those disordered region. I mean, so we might, we can use the rosetta fold and alpha fold to, to model something like folding upon binding, like in this case. So in this case, the, the magenta chain will be the, is the disordered protein, but it forms some kind of structure when it, it, it uh, generate the complex structure. So we can might uh, use the rosetta fold and alpha fold to predict Folding upon binding of the intrinsically disordered protein, but but if the law is just a dynamic, I mean the fluctuation is the main law, then then I'm not sure what we can do with alpha fold and rosetta fold. So thank you. May I may I just ask a quick follow up? I've I've heard people say that single span uh, integral membrane proteins in which mm -hmm. you have an alpha helix that uh, traverses the membrane have been poorly predicted by. Um, uh, AI methods. Uh, would you like to comment on that? Uh, uh, specific, I mean, specifically, what they, what I've been told, is that the um, the hydrophobic alpha helix that spans mm -hmm. the membrane uh, typically ends up somehow incorporated in, into the um, the structure of the um, uh, the globular portion of the protein that's inside the cell or the globular portion of the protein that's outside the cell. And the algorithm is unaware that this um, completely hydrophobic alpha helix is operating as a single span connection between those mm -hmm. two portions of the protein. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's something like if you have some extracellular domain and intracellular domain, and there's a, a single helix which actually yeah. connect them in the transmembrane region. Right. Yeah, so because both alpha fold and rosetta fold doesn't care about their environment. So when it predicts the structure, actually, it doesn't know about, I mean, it knows that, I mean, it might understand that should be in the transmembrane, but when they generate structure, there's no constraint to make those two different domain in the different part, I mean, in the different region. Sure. So that is the current, yeah, current yeah. limitation of both methods. Yeah, thank you. I, uh, I'm, I'm terrific to get that, uh, that response from the expert. Uh,